Alhamdulillah, we praise Allah, we seek his aid and we seek his forgiveness. We seek the refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves and the evil of our deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can misguide. And whomsoever Allah allows to be led astray, none can guide. And I bear witness that there's no one worthy of worship except Allah Ta'ala, the exalted. And that Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is his last messenger and slave. O you who believe, fear Allah and die not except in a state of Islam, in a state of submission. O humanity, fear your Lord who created you from a single soul and from that created its mate and from that scatters many men and women. O humanity, fear your Lord and do not cut off relations with your kin. Indeed, Allah is ar raqib He is the ultimate monitor over you. O humanity, fear your Lord and speak the truth. Qawlan sadida. In return, yuslih lakum a'malakum. He will rectify for you your affairs. Wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. And he will forgive you of your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has indeed achieved the greatest achievement. As to what follows, indeed the best speech is the book of Allah. And the best guidance is that of Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And of the worst affairs in our doctrinal system of Islam are the newly invented ones. For every newly invented affair in our situation is an innovation. And for every innovation is a form of going astray from the Sirat al Mustaqim, from the straight path. And every form of going astray is in the fire of hell. And we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that. I have an ancient love story for you all that took place. All of us may know of this love story, and some of us may not, but it was definitely a love story. And this love story is so appropriate for us now, until the end of time. A long time ago, rather, during the time of the prophethood, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the time of the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in the early stages of the advent of Islam, before hijrah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was preaching the message and there were few that accepted the message. But the few that accepted recognized that there would be trials and tribulations that would take place. From them was a woman that embraced Islam with her husband. With her husband. And both of their families were in Mecca, well-known tribes. They faced trials and tribulations in the beginning of the message of Islam. And upon these trials and tribulations, they were ordered to make hijrah, to migrate to Abyssinia, modern-day Ethiopia. And when they went there, they left, and they were with a Christian king, a non-Muslim, that harbored them and took care of them and looked after their safety. Even to the degree that some of the mushrikeen, the polytheists of Mecca, went there and tried to retrieve them to continue this process of oppression upon people that just wanted Allah and his messenger. And that's it, nothing tangible. The two didn't succeed. So they stayed there. The two that wanted to bring them back from the polytheists did not succeed. So they stayed there in, Mecca, in, uh, in Abyssinia. But they heard that two great individuals embraced Islam in Mecca. One by the name of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an and Hamza radiallahu an that they embraced Islam and that everything was all good. Everything was getting better. Al-umur tahassanat. That everything was getting better with the situation of the Muslims. Lo and behold, when they got there, the two individuals that, made, that migrated to Abyssinia, they came back and recognized that the situation was getting worse. So for this woman, we want to talk about three trials. For this great woman, Hind, better known as Umm Salama radiallahu anha. She faced three great trials. The first of them was after embracing Islam and coming back from Abyssinia with her husband Abu Salama. And seeing that the trials were getting worse, they were being persecuted, made fun of, called names. Sounds familiar. This was what was going on during the early prophethood time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to where they were ordered to make hijrah to al Madina. So the first test is the trials that she faced with her family and her peoples in Mecca, her own blood, her own relatives, her own people in Mecca. Facing these trials because she was Muslim and that was it. 
When they wanted to make Hijrah to Al-Madinah, they set out on their way, her and her, and her, hus and her husband, Abu Salama. Upon this voyage, they heard the family of Umm Salama. The family of Umm Salama heard that they were going to migrate to Al-Madinah. And they were not pleased with this. They were not pleased with this. So they came and they tried to stop Umm Salama radiallahu anha. And they succeeded in stopping her. And they said, you, you can leave. But as for your child, you've taken your child here and there. Keep the child with us. He is our child, Salama, radiallahu an, young boy. So they took the child. But upon this, the family of Abu Salama came and they heard and there started to be friction. So much so that it was narrated, that Abu Salama narrated herself, that when they were trying to pull the arm of Abu Salama, it dislocated. Young boy, radiallahu an, dislocated. They wanted to take the child and they succeeded. And the family of Abu Sa family of Umm Salama took Umm Salama. So she was with her family. Abu Salama fled to al Madina. So there's Umm Salama in, in, al in Mecca with her family, with her parents. Salama with the grandparents of Umm Salama. And Abu Salama fled to al Madina. F family is split apart. This is the second trial. The splitting apart of her family. Yearning for her husband. Yearning for her child. It was narrated that she would go to the hilltop. The actual setting of this oppression that took place. Of the tribal oppression between Beno Abdul Asad and Ben Al-Makhzum. The tribes of the family members of Umm Salama and Abu Salama. That this took place. She would go there on a daily basis that was narrated for almost a year, crying, reminiscing, thinking about this event, crying until her cousin saw her, asked her what was wrong. She narrated to him. He went to the family and rebuked them for what they did. And after the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the nasr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his help and his assistance, the family members granted Umm Salama her child and allowed her to go and be with her husband. But brothers and sisters, let's stop for a minute. It was very easy for her to go back to her family. This is too difficult for me. This Islam, I love it, I feel it. But I don't think it's supposed to be difficult. Hasha wa kalla. Definitely not. Rather, the difficulties bring ease. The difficulties are a test for you. When you are in your orientation in your job, they're going to put you through difficulty to see if you can handle it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put these difficulties there for Umm Salam, but rather, He put these difficulties there for you and me to read, to hear, to listen, to benefit, to ask Allah for thabat, to make us firm, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He would say in his prostration, in the lowest position, asking the Most High, Ya Muqallibul Qulub, Thabbit Qalbi Ala Deenik. He would say, Oh, the one that makes the hearts firm, make my heart firm on your religion. Why firm? Why was this so important to say? Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the Quran, after A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ حَرْفٍ After A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ حَرْفٍ فَإِنْ أَصَابَهُ خَيْرٌ نِطْمَ أَنَّ بِهِ وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ فِتْنَةٌ نِنْقَلَبَ عَلَىٰ وَجْهِ خَسِرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةَ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْخُسْرَانُ he said, and from mankind, from mankind, not all of them, but from them. And Alim is well aware, the all-knowing is well aware. What does he say? From mankind, there will be people that worship Allah on a verge. And then he gives an example. Ala harf, explaining it. What is the harf? If good was to befall him, I'm all good. It's good. How is everything? Alhamdulillah. I have my job. I have my children. Everyone's healthy. Alhamdulillah. But if fitna, a trial or a tribulation was to befall him, 
And linguistically, inqalaba means to flip ala wajhi on his face, saying that he would just give up. He or she would give up. We see what is going on now and we perceive, we perceive, we perceive that things are going to be so evil for us as Muslims. This is where it's so important for you to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with your perception, for you to connect with Allah. So you don't do as Allah says, How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe these people? خَسِرَ dunya wal akhirah. They lost in this life and in the next life. Then he describes that loss. ذَلِكَ هُوَ خُسْرَانُ مُبِينَ That is a clear loss. I'm facing too much pressure. Ask yourself this question. Are you practicing? Are you trying Islam when it is convenient? Or are you trying, are you practicing Islam because you know it is the only means of salvation? أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. الحمد لله على إحسانه والشكر توفيق أمتناني. So we see the two tests of مسلمة رضي الله عنها. The first one being when she came back from Abyssinia and recognized that it was not as they thought it, it would be, that things would be better, the situation of Islam would be better, rather it got worse. Sometimes we may think that the situation of Islam in America may be better, but something else happens. Something unexpected may happen from what almost the whole world anticipated opposite or the majority of the world. This is very important to understand that detaching yourself from this life at least five times a day is what is commanded from Allah. Because I could just say praying. But when we say the word as salah praying is a form of detaching yourself from the dunya. You are in a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why it is impermissible to speak during the salah. If you speak during the salah, salatuka batila, your prayer, you need to repeat your prayer. If it is worldly speech, you need to repeat your prayer. Speech with other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what is recommended, obliged, is obligatory upon you at least five times a day. What does that do if someone is sincere and thinking about the actions of Allah upon them in their life at least five times a day? What would that do to the individual? That detachment, if one has that, throughout the day, what would that make you? You would definitely, by the permission of Allah, not be someone that worships Allah ala harf. That is just on the verge, I worship him when it's convenient. You recognize that if I wasn't praying, I know I would be a misguided person. I know that I would do misguided things. I know that I would take on characteristics of those who are misguided. Meaning people that take on their desires rather than Loving what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has brought. Desiring what the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, has brought. This is important. Looking at the third test of Umm Salama radiallahu anha. Seeing that she is on her way to Al-Madinah. She has her child with her. She travels to Al-Madinah. And when we say traveling now, it's not traveling of 2016. It's by foot or with a donkey or with a camel. So she's with her young son, injured son, radiallahu anhuma, and she reaches a place called Tan'im. She runs into a non-Muslim who was later a member of the family of the people that were appointed to have the keys to the Kaaba, Uthman bin Talha. She runs into him and he asks what her, asks what her affair is. He, she, he, she, he sees that she's traveling and he says, you will not go to Medina except without me. Non-Muslim helping her all the way to Medina, which by the way was a 12 day travel. He traveled 12 days with her and the description of his mannerisms with her, subhanAllah, when she would come down from the camel, he would walk away. 
and then when she would come back up, he would come and they would, it would proceed. When she reached Al Madina, Alhamdulillah, she reached, she was with her husband and with her child, her children and her family. She's with her husband. But then her husband fights in the Battle of Uhud, in the Battle of Badr. And he had an internal injury that lasted for about a month to where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided from his qadr to take his life. Abu Salama. Radiallahu anha. And she was so sad. Radiallahu anha. When she approached him, she came to him. And Abu Salama was injured. She came to him and she said a beautiful thing. Romantic thing, to be honest. She said, I heard that a woman that is married to a man that doesn't get married, or a woman that does not get married in the dunya, that was married to a man that dies and is an inhabitant of Jannah, if she does not get married, they will be husband and wife in Jannah. They will be husband and wife in Jannah. So he said, okay, I, won't order, I will order you not to get married. Would you, will you obey me? She said, would I have not consulted you other than that reason? Upon that, she basically said she is not going to get married after Abu Salama. But Abu Salama, radiallahu anhu, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him. This is why may Allah be pleased with him. After fighting the battle of Badr and the battle of Uhud, look at his, his, how, he, how he speaks to her. After he says that, he said, oh Allah, bless her to be married to a man that is righteous and better than me. That does not make her sad nor oppress her. Radiallahu anhuma. So she remembered, she remembered one day that Abu Salama entered in the house. He said one day he came in and he said, I was just with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said something that made me so happy. He said that a Muslim is not afflicted with something except that he does istirja, that he says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Allahumma jurni fi musibati wa khufni khayran minha. O a'qibni khayran minha. Fi riwayat in ukhra in another narration. He said that I was with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he entered happy into the house happily. And he said the Messenger just told me something. He said a Muslim is not afflicted with an affliction except that he says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Verily we are for Allah and to Allah we will return. O oh Allah, reward me for my trial and compensate with for me something that is better than that. She remembered the, the dua that her husband taught her from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Husbands, fathers to your daughters and to your wives. Are we telling our children about the ahadith that bring comfort and bring ease and bring the strength of our aqidah, of our connection with Allah or not? Because she remembered this at the time that it needs to be remembered. So she said it. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Allahumma ajurni fi musibati wa khlufni khayran minha. Ajurni fi musibati wa khlufni khayran minha. She said this dua. Only, listen closely, after this third trial, some of us may have thought our life was over. My husband died. My loved one only to be an individual, a woman that said to herself, Man min Abi Salama. Who's better than Abi Salama? No one! She loved him so much, she did not want to marry after him. Fi nafsiha. The hub, the love that she had for him, she didn't want to marry after him. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came and proposed to her. She had young kids. Someone mentioned that it was four kids. Came and proposed to her. And she was an elderly woman, but she was very beautiful that was mentioned. Very beautiful woman, mashaAllah, radiallahu anha. Abu Bakr came and proposed. She refused. She refused. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam came and proposed. And she refused in the beginning. But she mentioned three things about herself <laughs> And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded al kalam, SubhanAllah, which we do not have enough time to go into. But if you have the opportunity to look at the life of Umm Salama 
and how she got married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the three things that he told her, she ended up marrying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she had no problems with the other wives of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was the trial of Umm Salama, but Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala assisted her. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala answered the dua of Umm Salama radiallahu anha. Do we notice that? After the trials, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala answered her dua. When you are in a trial, do you make dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Question to ask yourself. Do you turn to Allah immediately? Do you detach yourself from the tangible problems to see if the one that is in control and that created the tangible problems, the things that we can see and touch and feel, the one that created it, do we immediately turn to him? This is a question we should ask ourselves. This is a question we should ask our children. We should ask our children and not say they're too small to understand. How do you prepare them? This is what we should ask. So firstly, recognizing brothers and sisters that the trials and the tribulations will continue. Don't worry. There will always be an Abu Lahab of our generation. There will always be an Abu Talib. They will always be present. So what is our responsibility? The next question is, what is our responsibility? Not looking at your rights, but looking at your responsibilities. Because if you think about it, every responsibility is a right for someone else. Think about that. Every responsibility that you have fulfills the right of someone else. It's a right that someone deserves. If you fulfill that responsibility, you are giving them their right. This is very important. We see this with one of the greatest individuals, radiallahu anhu, of service. And that's what we want to mention here. After realizing the trials and tribulations, how does one deal with that? They serve Allah by serving the people. People, not only Muslims, Muslims and non-Muslims. Muslims and people that don't know about Islam. Muslims and people that may know about Islam and hate Islam. We serve them. We serve them. We see that with Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And brothers and sisters, in this era, we should take the opportunity to read about the life of Umar when he was, a, when he was the caliph of Islam, after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even in many issues in fiqh, in Islamic jurisprudence, it goes back to the days of Umar radiallahu anhu. Because he had to make tough decisions. One of the characteristics of Umar is that he would go out at night this is the Khalifa to Muslimin fil Ard. This is the Caliph of the Muslims of the whole world. He would go out at night and look at the affairs of every individual to his capacity. There was one night he was with one of his servants, Aslam, by the name of Aslam. He goes and it's a dark, it's a dark, cold night. He sees a blazing fire. He goes up to the fire and he sees that it's a woman with her children. Listen closely. It's a woman with her children crying. He goes up and he says, As-salamu ala ahl al-dhaw. Wa ma qala ahl al-nar. He says, As-salamu alaykum to the people of the light. He didn't say the people of the fire. He says, As-salamu ala ahl al-dhaw. Adnu, he said, can I, can I sit down? Can I come and sit down next to you? She said, if you want evil, then go. But if you want good, no problem. So he sits down. He sees a pot of water that is boiling. He asks, what's in this pot? She said, I'm boiling water and it had stones inside of the pot. The reason I'm boiling the water is so the kids will stop crying to where they will think I am cooking and they will go to sleep. And then she said, Wallahu baini wa baina Umar ibn al-Khattab. Ibn al-Khattab. She didn't know that that was Umar. She didn't know that that was Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu. So she was mad, she said, Allah is between me and him. She was very upset with him. So he said, how do you know that Umar, doesn't, that Umar knows your situation? She said, how can he, listen, how can he lead the people and not know my situation? How could he take that responsibility and not know what we're suffering? So when he heard that, <clears throat> he rushed. And in Arabic, it says, you hard will. You hard will. It's like to, to, run, to walk briskly, almost running, like what you do in tawaf, between the, when, you, when you run around the, the, the Kaaba, circumambulate around the Kaaba. 
So he rushed back to the pantry, and some mentioned to get some flour and some, some animal fat. And he asked Aslam to put the bag on his back. Aslam said, no, I'll take it. He said, no, Amir al-Mu'mineen, I'll take it. He said, atahmilu wizri yawm al-qiyamah. Wayhak. Wayhak. Atahmilu wizri yawm al-qiyamah. Look at the statement of Umar, of a leader. Influence, leadership is influence. He says, wayhak. Shame on you, or if he says, leave me. Are you going to carry my sins on the day of judgment? <laughs> Just again, detaching, reminding you about the day of judgment, reminding you about detaching yourself. What really matters with this tangible? The intangible is what matters. So he carries this on his back and this shows you that Omar couldn't pick it up himself. He goes back to the woman, another sign of humility. He gets down in the fire and cooks it himself. And Aslam describes it that the fire, that the fire was going through his beard. Radiallahu anhumah. The fire was going through his beard. So he cooked, they ate, the kids played and laughed and wrestled until they went to sleep. So Aslam wanted to talk to him. He asked him a question. Umar didn't respond. When the kids went to sleep, Umar said, I wanted to wait and see that the kids were happy and went to sleep. Amir al-Mu'minin is sitting with a woman that is destitute. He's sitting there and he's cooking for her and her children. And he waits till they go to sleep. What kind of influence does that have? What kind of service would that, is that? He's with the lesser people. He's dealing with them. He's cooking for them. Soup kitchens can be done nowadays. We see in the 1960s, if many of y'all familiar with the Black Panthers, they started the, bre the free breakfast movement. Look it up, free breakfast system. In the 60s, the time of turmoil, civil rights, racism. The Black Panthers, African-American individuals that took a stand and they wanted to serve the people that were underserved, not only African-Americans, Latinos, Caucasians, people that were underserved because it was poverty and hunger. They took it upon themselves to do the free breakfast program, and they fed individuals to where we see the free lunch program has intertwined with that, and it is something that has been inculcated in schools in the late 70s because people had concern about humanity and they gave back. And this is what Umar ibn al-Khattab did. And we see that nowadays with people that may have a certain type of profile, they may criminalize a certain name to where Muslim is synonymous with terrorist. They'll criminalize a certain name. You as a Muslim do not allow that by your actions. Joining PTOs of your children. If your child has a basketball game, go to their game. Go to someone at your, in your masjid, go to their, their events. Get involved in, the, in, 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 hum, in helping for humanity, in building homes. Get involved with feeding the poor. Buy yourself, make 150 sandwiches and go and distribute them amongst the people. And the only PR that we should be concerned about is yes, let me take my wife because they will see hijab and we come once a week or every week, and they see that, well, those people, those Muslims, the guy with the beard and the, Muslim, the lady with the thing on her head, I don't know what they are, but they're feeding us. What kind of effect will that leave? Deal with the people that need you, that people that need someone. And that is exactly how we serve and how we deal with our trial, trials and tribulations. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم صل السلام والمسلمين اللهم صل السلام والمسلمين اللهم صل السلام والمسلمين اللهم متعنا بأبصارنا وقواتنا أبدا ما أحيتنا وجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا وانصرنا على من عدانا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا ما بلغ علمنا يا أيها المؤمنون إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكر الله يذكركم Remember Allah and he'll remember you واشكروه على نعمه يزدكم And be thankful he will increase you ولا ذكر الله أكبر And the remembrance of Allah is the greatest thing والله يعلم ما تصنعون And he is well aware of what you do أقيم الصلاة